Alright, so in this episode, I'm going to be showing you how to create a journal similar to this one using Adobe Illustrator, the Glowforge, and a cinch binding machine. And although the illustration I'm showing is actually going to be different than this, it's basically the same concept and will cover the same skills. So the first step here is actually I need to get a basic template for the size of the book I'm creating and for the holes that are going to be punched by the cinch binding machine. And so what I did was I actually took a photo or actually scanned um, an image of a page that was punched with the cinch binding machine. And now I'm going to line up my holes with that using Adobe Illustrator. So here you can see I'm resizing it to be a five by seven cover. And now I'm lining it up, moving it behind the artwork I've already created. And now I'm going to check its alignment with the holes that I've already made. So you can see I'm already a little bit ahead here because I've already created the holes, but I am going to walk you through how I did that. So I'm going to copy the artwork over and I'm just going to create a circle with a colored outline so that I can see it. And then I'm going to be using my transform and move tool to get that to align. So the cinch binding machine is a two one pitch binding machine, which means that there's two holes per inch of space. So starting at the bottom, I'm going to line the hole up and then I'm going to go to transform, move, and I'm going to kind of make a guess here. So I have preview on, but I want it to move vertically, not horizontally. So I'm going to set horizontal to zero and then the vertical to half of an inch. And I'm going to preview that and you can see it's moving in the wrong direction. So all I have to do is set that to a negative value and then hit copy and that will copy it. And if I hit Command D, it will allow me to continue copying it from the current object that I've created. So you can see here the background artwork is slightly crooked, but for the most part it makes sense. And now this top hole, for some reason with the machine, is a little bit closer, so I just hand adjusted that. So now the final part of this first step is just rotating the artwork to confirm that the holes are lined up and then making sure that the cover itself is a little bit larger than the pages. And the reason for that is we don't want the pages sticking out beyond the cover. Now that I've confirmed that my cover outline is the correct size and my holes are lined up, I'm going to create a new layer and I'm going to go to this other file that has a variety of sketches that I've done really quickly for a different set of sample wedding invitations. And I'm going to pick one of the designs that I'd like to use for this cover select it, and then copy and paste it into my new cover artwork. All right, so now I'm going to just drop in that artwork into its own layer. And if this was a raster graphic, you'd be able to double click the layer and set it to be a template or dim the image 50%. Because these are vector lines, I'm actually just going to have to grab them really quickly and change their color. So I'm gonna unlock the layer, grab them, and then I'm going to lighten them to a lighter shade of gray so that I'll be able to see my line art over top of the drawing in the background. Now that that's set up, I'm just checking everything here. I'm gonna create a new layer for me to do my line art on, and I'm gonna grab my brush tool. Now I'm actually using a tablet for this, and I'm gonna use a new calligraphic brush. So I'm gonna select calligraphic brush from the brush menu. I'm gonna set the size to three, and then I'm gonna set pressure to three. So that means that I will have a brush that will vary by three points and it will vary based on the pressure that I use on my actual tablet. I'm going to select a bright color so that I can see it over top and then I'm going to begin working on my actual line art. One thing worth noting is you can change the pressure settings by double clicking on the brush tool which you saw happen really quickly there. So now this next stage is going to be a really really fast sped up version of the few hours it took me to do this actual completed illustration.
So we're reaching the end of the actual illustration process here, and the entire illustration has been drawn simply using that 3-3 pressure brush on my tablet. So I've actually colored the different sections with different colors, not for any real purpose other than I need to be able to see the difference between the actual flowers and the lily pads, because I'm going to try and cut the inner spaces of the flowers as like holes in the book cover, but I want the pink areas to be outlined with an engraving to help define those shapes. In order to achieve that, what I'm going to do is copy the artwork and create a peach rectangle and set it behind the actual art. So once I've done that, I can select everything together and then I'm going to go to my Pathfinder panel and hit Divide. With that done, I can take my white arrow and delete any of the sections I do not need. So the whole reason I did this is because, as I said, I want to make sure that the inner spaces of the flowers are cut out. And for the Glowforge to see that, I'm going to need to have those as unique shapes. So now I'm going to use my uh, magic wand, which will select a color for me. I'm going to select that magenta color, and I'm going to set it to outlines. Because what I am going to have that do, eventually, is sort of be the engraved outline around the shape. So I'm walking through, I'm using my smooth tool and my white arrow tool to clean up any stray or kind of unusual areas in the line art so that when it goes to the laser, it'll be nice and clean and I won't have any strange visual artifacts. So you can see what I'm trying to do here with this rightmost flower. I've deleted all of the inner drawings just left that purple outline around the outermost part of the shape so that we'll be able to define its edge when it's engraved. And then I've left those peach areas on the inside because I want those to be cut as holes. Okay, so this next section of the video is just me cleaning things up. I'm using the smooth tool, which is usually hidden behind the pencil tool in the left-hand side, and then using my direct selection tool, which is that white arrow, to fix up any sort of odd spaces because I want it to be really nice and neat as we go to the next stage. stage of adjustments here and what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab all of the artwork that I want to be engraved and I'm going to set it to outline stroke. Once I've done that I'm going to change all of it to green so that it will all be one function inside of uh, the Glowforge interface. Now I'm sure that went by really quick but if you missed it all you have to do is go to the object stroke outline stroke and that's in that top object drop down from the menu. And now it's just a little bit more cleanup. What I'm trying to do here is make sure that there's enough space around these holes that are going to be in the design that there's not going to be anywhere where the wood is so thin that it's not going to hold together that it's going to snap and break. With that completed I'm going to move into the Glowforge interface. So here you can see I have saved my file as a PDF from Illustrator and I've moved it into the interface here, so I've just uploaded it as normal. I've made sure that all of the areas I was going to want to cut or move independently were their own color, so that they're on their own layers, as shown here on the left. Now, this is the medium walnut plywood. Mine is not actually proof grade, it's from Johnson's Plastics, but it works perfectly fine with the medium walnut plywood settings. So now I just have to go through really quickly and make sure everything is set correctly, whether it's going to be engraving or whether it's going to be cutting. And I'm actually going to reorder the layer order so that the actual book outline is cut last. If it's cut first, sometimes it'll kind of fall through and then your design might be off. So we're at 
the final stage, which is binding the book. I've cut all of my pages to size using a stack cutter, and now I'm going to follow the instructions on the front of the machine itself, which are pretty self-explanatory. For a page this size, I just need to make sure that the ruler's all the way in, keep my stacks relatively small, and then do a punch like this. And if you miss one, it just means one of your tabs is pulled out, so pop that back in, slide your page back in, punch it, and then slide the ruler all the way out. Then using the instructions on the front, it tells me to pull that tab out so that I won't have a hole that's kind of on the top edge. Punch that sheet, and then we can see that that's complete. So from here, I'm just going to cut the rest of my stacks really quickly, and then move on to the actual binding. So you can see, in order not to confuse myself, I did all of the punches that required the pulled out tab and then did the rest of the punches without the pulled out tab. And here you can see I got some of the little circles stuck in the machine, so I just used some can air to push them out. If you don't have the piece of paper all the way pushed back into the machine, your holes are not going to line up. And now I'm ready for the actual spiral binding. So this is a two one pitch spiral and it can be cut down to size depending on the size of your actual book. And now you can see this one is not the correct size, but I'm just using it to demonstrate how the rack on the right is used to line up and apply and slide the pages onto the quail, essentially. If you were doing your covers as well, you just need to slide those on at the end and they sort of need to be facing each other and upside down. A little bit of practice and testing will show you how that's done. Once all of your pages and your covers are on the spiral, you're going to sit it in the back and then adjust this little push and turn knob at the top and pinch down on your binding using the handle. So here you can see a finished book. I'm going to slide it in the back, bring the handle down, and it will close your binding for you. And you should have something that looks like this. Finally, I'm going to open it back up to confirm that my covers are facing the correct direction and that they look right. And that is our completed book. Thank you so much for watching, and if you have any questions about the settings, just check out the blog link below. Thanks!